uh, we shall now go on to Dr. Santosh Hunavar, who's going to be talking on advances in retinoblastoma. And let's look forward to some highly charged next few minutes. On to you, Thank Dr. Santosh. Thank you, Chitra. While uh, Pratibha shares the screen and I share my screen, let me congratulate you for conceptualizing a wonderful program and choice of speakers and the topics. Very good job. So. I'll be speaking about uh, the recent advances in retinoblastoma as uh, Chitra has indicated and try to stick to time. Well, the, if you look at this timeline, you see how impressive it has been the success in managing retinoblastoma. We started off in 1900s with 98% mortality and the Trends are totally reversed in 2020 with more than 98% survival. This is possibly the only malignancy of all systemic malignancies where we could achieve this higher success. That's because we have been able to get a handle on the management of retinoblastoma by using several techniques. Of course, the primary aim is always life salvage followed by eye and vision salvage as secondary and tertiary aims. What is new about retinoblastoma? We already are familiar with international grouping and staging. This is international grouping and staging, which have been there for uh, several years already. But what is really new is uh, TNM staging. This is this chart actually shows TNM staging and some of uh, this is asked in the exam. And something unique about TNM staging in retinoblastoma, which is not there for any other malignancy, is the addition of H criteria. T is for tumor, M is for metastasis, and N is for nodes but H is never there for any other malignancy except retinoblastoma, so that's something unique. What about focal therapy? Cryotherapy has good success for peripherally located uh, small tumors, which are about three to four millimeter in diameter and three to four millimeter in success in uh, thickness. It produces a large scar, which may not be acceptable if the tumor were to be located on the temporal aspect or if there is any risk of uh, say, um, epiretinal membrane over the macula if you were to do cryotherapy to a kind of tumor which is located not exactly in the periphery but more towards the center. Laser photocoagulation is not acceptable because it produces a very large scar because laser is performed around the tumor and not on top of it. Also it can cause vascular occlusion as you see here and of course visual field defects, ILM rupture and production of vitreous seeds. So what's really taken off in the management of focal tumors is transpupillary thermotherapy, where we laser on top of the tumor. This is sub-photocoagulation laser, which heats up the tumor to about 45 to 60 degrees centigrade, does, in, does inducing tumor cell apoptosis. So classically, it does not produce a larger scar th than you began with, and the blood vessels that pass through the tumor are quite patent. So minimal complications are seen with transpupillary thermotherapy. What is new in transpublary thermotherapy is photodynamic uh, thermotherapy or ICG enhanced thermotherapy where we use in indocyanin green injection and then on top of that do transpublary thermotherapy specifically in patients who have a non-pigmented scar. So this patient has a recurrence over a previous scar that is a recurrence which will not take up standard TTT well. So when you inject ICG, that causes synergistic effect. And with a couple of sessions, you can see that the recurrent retinoblastoma is regressed. So this is absolutely new in the management of retinoblastoma. Plaque is not new, but the indications of plaque have changed with the advancing advancement in the design of the plaque, especially notch plaque. We can reach the juxtapapillary tumor quite easily. Like this patient who has a juxtapapillary tumor, Earlier, we were not able to reach it with protection of the optic nerve. Now you can see nice results with protection of the optic nerve, which looks very healthy. And the tumor has calcified following this use of notch plaque. So there are specific indications for plaque brachytherapy. And what is new in the management of uh, retinoblastoma using plaque brachytherapy is the Indian plaque, which is made by BARC, which costs less than 5% of the imported plaque. So it has become much more affordable. So uh, for focal therapy, less is more. And what is new is, uh, of course, ICG enhanced TTT. And what is on the horizon is transcleral strontium radiation and also chemoplaque, which is already under trial by uh, some of the groups in Canada. Chemotherapy brought about a paradigm change. These four articles in archives of ophthalmology, now JAMA 1996, 
brought about a change in the management of retinoblastoma from radiation to chemotherapy. Intravenous chemotherapy is uh, become the standard of care, was the standard of care, I should say, at least in the West. Now it's changed over to intraarterial chemotherapy, but in India, it is still the standard of care where we use carboplatin, etoposide, and vincristine and get very nice results. As you see here, this large tumor becomes a much smaller scar. One more tumor here becomes a much smaller scar and the macular fovea is very nicely exposed. And as the tumor regresses towards its feeder vessel, here the feeder vessel is supratemporal blood vessel. It leaves the fovea macula very early in the management uh, uh, course, thus maximizing visual potential. Intravenous chemotherapy still remains the standard of care in India. Whereas what has come about are various other forms of giving chemotherapy, such as high-dose intravenous chemotherapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy or uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy, periocular and epibulbar chemotherapy using drug delivery systems, and intravitreal, and the latest is intracameral chemotherapy. Now, intra-arterial chemotherapy technique is well known. It is injected into the ophthalmic artery directly by cannulating it using a 400 micron catheter. You peep into the ostium of the ophthalmic artery and then inject a series of three drugs. We use a combination of topotican, melphalan, and carboplatin. Instead of using just melphalan, which is of course good, but you might uh, have to give more number of cycles. When we combine it with topotican and carboplatin, the success is much better with fewer number of cycles, thus saving a lot of cost and also reducing the sessions of anesthesia for these children. You can see nice results with intra-arterial chemotherapy with tri triple drug protocol, total retinal detachment settled with one cycle, a large tumor reduced to a much smaller scar after three cycles of intra-arterial chemotherapy, and a recurrence on top of a prior calcified scar gone away nearly totally with one cycle. So this is really magical in terms of response. And for, uh, say, a group B tumor, the success is 100%. In fact, all the tumors regress just with intraarterial chemotherapy if, if you were to use it for an early tumor. But generally, we don't want to use it for a group B or a group C tumor where we can simply use intravenous chemotherapy with equal amount of success. There's hardly any difference in success between IVC and IAC in group B and C tumor. But the success starts manifesting when you go to group D. Group D has about 50 to 60 percent chance of success with intravenous chemotherapy, whereas with IAC, success increases to 92 percent. That's a huge jump. And in, in group E retinoblastoma, success used to be with uh, intravenous chemotherapy about 30 to 50 percent. Now there is much better success with intra arterial chemotherapy. And with the secondary IAC, where you have failed intravenous chemotherapy, and then for a recurrence or a failed intravenous chemotherapy, you give intraarterial chemotherapy, success is excellent. So intraarterial chemotherapy makes a difference for group D and E retinoblastoma and for large recurrences or non-response to intravenous chemotherapy. Vitreous seeds were the major bugbear in the management of retinoblastoma. These are no longer vitreous seeds. We have many types of seeds in retinoblastoma now. This, of course, the classic vitreous seeds we always knew. Now, based on OCT, we can classify these as prehyloid, subhyloid, and epiretinal. On top of that, there is something called intraretinal, subretinal, we always knew, and then intracameral. Intracameral is further classified as depository when the seeds come through the zonules and settle in the anterior chamber, and infiltrative when there is contiguous extension into the anterior chamber by ciliary body, peripheral iris, and the angle. Now, how do you manage these vitreous seeds? Intravitreal chemotherapy has become the standard of care for the management of vitreous seeds following regression of intraocular retinal tumor. Basically, you wait for the retinal tumor to nearly totally regress. Then only you start injecting. You can see nice results with these focal vitreous seeds completely gone with melphalan. We use melphalan initially, but we started finding that with more and more injections, we have this problem of RP atrophy and also vascular occlusion and scarring. These also leads to uveitis, cataract, and needs weekly injections as opposed to three weekly injections with topotican. So because of better bioavailability and much better success with fewer number of injections, we have shifted to intravitreal topotican. You can see nice results with diffuse with receipts with intravitreal topotican. All this child needed was a couple of injections. There's one more uh, situation where there are Seeds completely gone with two doses of intravitreal topotican. 
patients need anywhere from two to six doses of intravitreal topotecan to get this kind of success. And when it doesn't happen, when there are refractory vitreous seeds, despite six injections of topotecan, like we started off with this huge number of vitreous seeds, after six injections of intravitreal topotecan, we still had residual vitreous seeds which are refractory. Then we add low dose melphalan and they go away. But note that retinal pigment epithelial atrophy has set in with melphalan. So melphalan does have complications, but when you use it in low dose, 10 or 20 microgram, the complications are much less. Excellent success with intravitreal topotecan was reported earlier. Now what we have is extended indications. Patients with anterior segment seeds were earlier straight, straight away enucleated. Now we give them the benefit of eye salvage by injecting topotecan intracamerally. Thankfully, it is not toxic to the corneal endothelium and you see clear cornea with the anterior chamber seeds gone with topotecan. One more example where there is a, a complete regression of anterior chamber seeds with a couple of injections of topotecan. When there is infiltrative retinoblastoma with anterior chamber extension because of ciliary body invasion, as you see here, you can do plaque brachytherapy for the ciliary body component. And for the anterior chamber seeds, you can inject topotic. And with this combined modality, there is better success. One more use of intravitreal topotecan is for extensive subretinal seeds. We never thought that this would be the response for subretinal seeds, but you can see all these extensive recurrent subretinal seeds are gone with intravitreal topotic and without any laser. One more situation where all these extensive subretinal seeds, which would have earlier lasered and caused a lot of retinal scarring, were completely gone away with intravitreal topotic. So retinoblastoma seeds seem to have been finally conquered. We all knew uh, know about the technique of enucleation and the importance of taking a long optic nostrum, but uh, something that must be followed following uh, enucleation is the identification of histopathological risk factors we seem to have a very high in, uh, chance of having uh, histopathological risk factors. Almost half the patients who undergo enucleation have this. And for them with anterior chambers, anterior segment invasion, ciliary body invasion, choroidal invasion of more than three millimeter in diameter or three millimeter in thickness, or optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina cryprosa, we provide adjuvant chemotherapy. All these children receive six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy and the results are very evident. You see that without adjuvant chemotherapy, they have 24% chance of developing metastasis. Whereas if you give adjuvant chemotherapy, you can save about 20% children. So chance reduces from 24 to 4%, thus salvaging about 20% lives. So that's very important. So enucleation is not the end in the management of retinoblastoma. Finally, orbital retinoblastoma, it could be primary when the child presents with orbital retinoblastoma, either clinically or radiologically, as you see on MRI here, or secondary when the child develops retinoblastoma in the orbit following enucleation. It used to have 70% mortality with orbital excentration as was done earlier. Now with a multimodal treatment protocol where we begin with new adjuvant systemic chemotherapy, this orbital component goes away and the eye becomes thysical at which point in time you would enucleate with a long optic nostrum, deliver stereotactic radiation, and follow it up with adjuvant chemotherapy. This is uh, used even for optic nerve extension, like this child who has optic nerve extension right up to the orbital apex, where enucleation would leave a residual tumor. You can use neoadjuvant chemotherapy to reduce the optic nerve component and then do enucleation. And for anterior intracranial extension, you can see that that's gone and what is left is simply at the superior orbital fissure amenable to radiation. You can get very nice cosmetic outcome like this child with primary orbital retinoblastoma now can use a nice prosthesis. This is a child with secondary orbital retinoblastoma without needing orbital excentration, it's gone away. So orbital retinoblastoma now has a cure with about 90% life salvage. With all this put together, we have about 95% life salvage in our series. And you can see the contributors for this success in life salvage, of course, new adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy and multimodal treatment have together contributed to about 98% life salvage. Whereas for eye salvage, intra-arterial chemotherapy, intravitreal chemotherapy and brachytherapy have played a role in increasing it to 80 to 90%. And for vision salvage, of course, we have intra-arterial chemotherapy, intravitreal topotic and not melphalan, and ICG enhanced transcriptionary thermotherapy have contributed about 80 to 90% vision salvage. In conclusion, I would say that retinoblastoma management continues to be complex, but what is important is 
the use of cost effective and protocol based management strategies which can help us get much better success thank you so much thank you <clears throat> very much dr santosh i have two questions for you one is uh, when you are doing intravitreal chemotherapy how do you avoid tumor seeding outside the eye the second question is if it's a bilateral retinoblastoma would you uh, what is uh, how do you rate doing a bilateral intraarterial chemotherapy well uh, first question uh, what we do is we wait for the retinal tumor to regress so that minimizes the risk of extraocular extension of retinoblastoma second we use what is called a safety enhanced technique we use a 30 or a 32 gauge needle and then we enter from an area where there is no retinal tumor inject and without taking the needle out we apply cryotherapy around the site of entry and the needle comes out through the eye ball so that kills any tumor cell if at all it would have theoretically come out second is a death by water technique where you uh, irrigate the ocular surface with uh, normal saline for about 3 minutes that is supposed to kill the tumor cells which have come out accidentally if at all and the third is subconjunctival injection of uh, topotecan around the site of injection and for uh, bilateral retinoblastoma we can do tandem intraarterial chemotherapy at the same session it takes a, a long much longer procedure but then it is possible and we have done it thanks a lot thank you vidya you have any question or shall i go on to dr v, uh, usha uh, sir any age limit the younger age minimum age limit for uh, intraarterial chemotherapy well 3 months is considered the age because the caliber of the artery is much smaller under that age and the weight of the child should be about 6.5 kg 6 to 6.5 kg that is the limit but of course there are reports of even 6 weeks old babies being uh, you know subjected to intraarterial chemotherapy so nothing seems to be the limit because we have even 200 micron catheters that are available now so that is not a problem i think okay. thank you dr santosh 